<lacht> genau, kurze Verschnaufpause, aber es geht wirklich gleich weiter. Und ich freue mich jetzt sehr, ich werde ins Englische gleich wechseln, aber kündige zumindest ganz kurz auf Deutsch an. Der nächste Impuls wird von Jeff Malgen gegeben und beschäftigt sich mit unserer Vorstellungskraft, eben Vorstellungskraft im sozialen und im politischen Bereich. Um, Jeff, I know you're already online. It's really my pleasure to introduce you. You are Sir Jeff Mulgan and professor at the University College in London. You were CEO of Nesta. This is how I met you and the Young Foundation and director of the UK Government Strategy Unit and head of policy in the Prime Minister's office. So your experience is extensive. You try to document it in various books, for example, The Art of Public Strategy and Big Mind, How Collective Intelligence Can Change Our World. And June 22nd is a special month for you because you just published a new book called Another World is Possible how to reignite social and political imagination. And this is also, I think, the focus of your talk. You'll talk about how the many crises around us, economic, health, ecological, political, coincide with a crisis of imagination. And will show, you will show us how we can actually better imagine and shape our society and economy in a generation ahead. We are very much looking forward to your input. You will start with a kind of presentation, but we will also have 10 minutes afterwards for a quick Q&A. So everybody here in the audience, please um, be ready for um, after the presentation, we will have a moment of actually asking some questions or making some statements. Jeff, over to you. I'm very much looking forward to this. Vielen Dank. Und es, es tut mir leid, dass, dass ich mich nicht mit Sie in, in Berlin. Ich war gestern Morgen in, in Deutschland, aber jetzt ich bin zurück in London. Uh, I will speak in English and I'm in a slightly strange position now because just opposite me on an apartment balcony are two people doing extraordinary yoga. Uh, so I can uh, try and ignore them and uh, concentrate on sharing some ideas with you. Uh, oh, you need to allow me to share my screen if I'm going to do that. Um, so please give me a permission. Uh, and I'm going to talk about Vorstellung and uh, imagination, why we may have a problem, uh, why we need cities to become better, at uh, boosting our imagination. And I'll talk about some, some specifics, though I can't actually share my screen yet. So maybe I will just talk. Ah, now I am the host, I will do so. To give you some prettier pictures to look at than, uh, than my face. So here we go. Uh, and this is a, a picture actually from, from Melbourne. As you said in the introduction, my background is a It is a mix of things. I've worked somewhat top down. I worked in the city government of London and I worked with many others from Seoul and Singapore to Sao Paulo and Stockholm, also in national governments and the European Commission. Sometimes working much more bottom up, creating NGOs of different kinds. And then, as you say, I ran Nesta for a while and have worked in that in between space. One final thing to mention, which I work on at the moment, is a thing called the International Public Policy Observatory, where throughout the pandemic, we have been trying to make sense of what should be done, what is being done. And uh, early this year, we launched a thing called IPO Cities, supported by Bloomberg, which linked cities discussing things like inequalities, recovery plans, mental health in the city. So if you're interested, look at the IPO Cities website, maybe take part in some of our events. We link up cities all over the world for these kind of quite intense conversations about the challenges now, and in particular, getting ready for what may be the, quite, the worst crises of 2023 and 24. I want to talk a bit more optimistically. As you said, I'm going to share a little bit about a book just out, 
an andere Welt ist möglich, something like that, uh, about reigniting social, radical social and political imagination. And part of the inspiration for this actually came from Germany. Uh, about two and a half years ago, I found myself talking to a lot of the teenagers involved in the school strikes in Sweden and Germany and the many others around the world who, were, who came to spend time with them. Uh, and I was so impressed with their, their energy, their clarity, their knowledge of the science but I was also depressed by them because they were so pessimistic about the future. They seemed to have no confidence there was any possibility of a better society, of solving social problems, reforming democracy. And I felt maybe this was part of a broader picture where we can imagine ecological disaster quite easily now and have good reason to do so. And we have quite strong imaginaries of future technology of robots or AI, uh, you know, taking over the world, taking all of our jobs, Berlin transformed by flying uh, taxis, but much less sense of social possibility and social change. And this has fed through into an extraordinary pessimism in much of the world. This is a survey from before COVID on where the parents expected their children to be better or worse off than them. And as you can see in many countries, including Germany, US, Canada, Spain, large majorities now assume their children's lives will be worse than them. This is a big turnaround. And there was an extraordinary piece of research done last year, which studied every book written for the last 150 years in English, German, and Spanish and analyze their emotions, the moods of these books. And these charts summarize some of the patterns. And the main thing to spot is there's not that much change for throughout the last century, 1900 to 2000. And then something about 20 years ago shoots upwards with these kind of catastrophizing, what they call cognitive distortions becoming much more common. And in some ways, this is a sense of the world out of control. We can't shape our future. Things can only get worse deep in our, in our culture uh, and causing, I think, all sorts of uh, uh, problems. And in some ways, this is perhaps a not surprising response to these layering of crises we see. We still haven't really recovered from the financial crisis of 2007. Many people have seen stagnant or falling income since then. That fed the political crisis, which gave us Brexit and Trump and maybe AFD and Salvini. The climate crisis getting worse, temperatures in the 60s in India this month, last month. Obviously, Ukraine, uh, energy crisis, food crisis, and so on. And so this is a time when I think we desperately need new options, new uh, ways of navigating our way through but I think we're lacking them. And in my book and other things I've done, I've criticized the political parties, the universities, others for having really vacated this space. So if you are a mayor or a minister, you, you're not bombarded with plausible options of how you could run your economy or society differently. And this led me to want to investigate the question of imagination. How has it been done? And how in different periods of history have we expanded what I call our possibility space, the options open to our society? Now, some of those will be determined by what we inherit and by structures and power, but some will be determined by our capacity to imagine and then to work out in more detail what might be a different way of running things. And so some of what I've looked at is the history. How did we do this stuff in the past? And my conclusion is, in many ways, we were better at this kind of collective imagination in the past. That was done sometimes through utopias, an extraordinary history of, of books, feminist utopias back to the 15th century. Bestsellers like Edward Bellamy in the late 19th century, who imagined a propertyless socialist future, including home deliveries and home uh, music stations. Works like uh, the feminist utopias of the 1960s and 70s, like Ursula Le Guin. 
very rich field, but very few in recent decades, far more dystopias than utopias recently. Kim Stanley Robinson's book, Ministry of the Future, is a, is a rare exception in that respect. Um, I look at the history of novel ideas, how they work their way through, and including ideas now like citizens' assemblies or the idea of everyone being given a carbon allowance or the circular economy, which has been around for 50 years, but is becoming a bit more real in our lives. I look at the role of creating places which can be inspirations from uh, Robert Owen, the top left, New Lanark in Scotland, which he created as a, a utopia, a living utopia of cooperation, or the garden cities, which spread all over the world in the late 19th century is a very different model of city and countryside integrated. The failures are interesting too, like on the bottom left, Google Sidewalks attempt to create a techno-driven smart city in Toronto, which was rejected. And this is one way of shaping the future by showing it in reality. And the same is true of, of nations. My family comes from New Zealand, which has a long history of, perhaps because it's so far away, of pioneering new ideas. It was the first country to give all women the vote, one of the first serious welfare states. And more recently, the well-being budgets of Jacinda Ardern, which rethink government through the lens of well-being, or giving legal personhood to nature, as they've done in several places. These are perhaps pointers to a future for every other country in the course of this century. And there are many, many other sources. The arts is a, a fantastic set of examples of how they transform our perceptions, bear witness to problems, uh, and uh, it may be helping us, as in the, the one in the middle there, think like a tree, see climate, air, using virtual reality. Or bottom right is the statue of Robert E. Lee in, in um, Virginia, which itself became an artwork for the Black Lives Matter movement. And the arts have a, a huge role to play in helping us to see and think differently. And these are just a few of the many, many methods uh, I, I explore. I guess more important then is what's the prescription? What could we do differently to become better at this? And for me, one of the some very simple ideas uh, I took from Picasso, though it's a very common idea, if you've ever seen the film, The Mystery of Picasso, it shows him painting on a glass screen and he paints a painting and then he gets bored with it and covers it over in black and does another one and then another one and another one. And you realize that his method was constant creative fertility, trying out many, many things to find the good ones. That's also what evolution does with genetic mutations. And yet surprisingly, it's quite rare in universities to use these methods. It's quite rare in cities and governments to try out 10, 20 different things in parallel and see which ones work. So a basic prescription is using these essentially elementary creativity methods. And to make that more specific, I show how you can use these generic tools to help a city reimagine how its libraries work or childcare or public parks, you try and generate options using things like extension, where you extend an existing model, maybe the idea of rights to a new purpose, or you invert, you switch roles around in the way that the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh turned farmers into bankers, or how do you turn patients into doctors or school pupils into teachers? And there are many, many others of these, grafting from other fields, see how you can maybe take ideas from airports into hospitals, or what if a library became, you know, a, a place of, um, of well-being and tranquility, they are to some extent, but made that their core. And I show how these tools quite quickly multiply your options. And there are many, many others which are in use all over the world from speculative design, speculative fiction, to um, the, the work of, of future generations commissioners in places like Wales, strategic foresight in governments, ministries of possibilities. There are lots of these around as methods for thinking more creatively, but they're very rarely at the heart, at the core of 
uh, city administrations or national governments or political parties. Now, I'm interested in how we change that. And last year for the new institute in Hamburg, uh, I wrote a piece on what universities could do differently, how they could become part of city and national imagination. And the picture you'll see there is from a, a, a center launched two weeks ago in Cardiff in Wales, which for me is a model of what I was trying to encourage in that paper. So it's in a university, but in this building, which houses 800 people, there are people from the city government, from the national government, from NGOs, research teams, creating a shared space in which they can work together on questions like how to care for the elderly in the future, how to deal with inequalities. And as one example of um, you know, what Wales is doing just this week in the media is then you experiment with a basic income, a, a basic income for care leavers, where every care leaver will be given, I guess about 25,000 euro a year without any questions asked to give them some security in the start of their adult life. And hopefully this center will work through what that means for a future welfare system. In my own university, UCL, we do a lot more project-based work with, um, with students so they can experience imagination and possibility. At the beginning of June, we had 1500 students on this program called How to Change the World working on air quality problems in Delhi, Nairobi and London, and they had to generate imaginative solutions, which were not just good in engineering terms, but also in social, cultural, economic terms. Again, getting that experience of, of collaborative design. And we're also launching a new undergraduate degree, all about mobilizing science and engineering for social change, not just for uh, economic efficiency. And there's a number of museums of the future appearing around the world. This is the one in Dubai, uh, which is actually an extraordinary place attempting to provide an experience of the different possibilities of the future. And I think every city should have a museum of the future alongside its many museums of the past where people can play with what might happen to work or childhood or old age or parliaments in 20, 50, 80 years time. And we now have some examples we can point to. And there's also a role for communities. We've run in the last two years in the UK through our, our big lottery fund, a program called the Emerging Futures Fund, which supported about 50 local community groups to work on their own collective imagination, their stories, their ideas, their visions of a desirable future in a way filling the space vacated by our political parties and others. And one of the things I found useful for these is using facts. I've just spent this morning, I was in two secondary schools working with teenagers and uh, who were full of imagination. And you start with, question, with, with facts like this. So here's the first one, amongst the elderly, cold symptoms, symptoms of having the illness of the cold, are less likely amongst the highly sociable than the less sociable. And that's very surprising. And the reason is that loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 40 cigarettes a day. And if you realize that, then you need to design your care system for the elderly with friendship and sociability and dancing, not just putting people in, in buildings. Or 48% of the lowest paid jobs were deemed essential in the US during the pandemic a far higher percentage than the highest paid. What does that tell us about you know, how our labor market has gone crazy and needs to be reformed? Or a more surprising one, which I still don't quite believe, electric bikes may be more carbon efficient than non-electric bikes, mainly because of the food we eat in order to power our non-electric bike. At least that starts a conversation. And a, a lot of what I've been working on with different groups is these kind of generative questions. And this is what I think cities need to be doing much more systematically with their universities, with community groups, with politicians. So here's one which comes very clearly out of the pandemic. The World Happiness Report before the pandemic showed the best predictor of national happiness was not GDP 
or life expectancy, but the quality of mutual support, how many people you could count on to help you in a crisis. This turned out to be really important in the pandemic, and yet it's almost a complete blind spot for governments and cities in terms of policy. So here's the question, what would you do if you really wanted to reinforce mutual support in your city or your community? What are the methods? What could you experiment with? What would you measure? And I think this is you know, a pretty useful thing to do. Much more familiar perhaps is what if you became carbon negative? Lots of cities doing fantastic work in Europe. We have the net zero hundred cities. In my view, most are still far behind though in using digital and data tools to help them. And that's maybe an, a conversation for another day. There's a strange mismatch there in terms of, uh, of that. Or what if democracy was redesigned to make the most of collective intelligence? Again, lots of experiments, some big, some small. In my view, Taiwan is probably leading the world in really generating a 21st century democracy where people can propose ideas, comment, contribute to decision making in partnership with elected representatives. It's certainly far ahead of anything in, in my country. And cities are the ideal scale for really rethinking how democracy works. I mentioned welfare, universal basic incomes and so on. To my mind, some of the key questions of future welfare are about this link with mental health and anxiety. And one of the really striking findings from the many experiments with basic incomes is they have a big effect on anxiety levels. Just knowing you will have enough cash in a month or two months time, not worrying too much about debt or feeding your children turns out to be a really important part and missing desperately in the welfare systems of many countries like the US or the UK and, and most of Southern Europe. There's lots of work underway in the commons, including I know in Berlin. So how can we make this more specific, more real? What could the commons idea be doing for land or housing or data or the oceans? This is a huge set of questions, which can only be answered through, I think, real life experiments. Or what have we really got rid of the cars? Many cities are beginning to plan for a future, maybe 20 years ahead, where most cars are driverless. Now, if you have that city, you don't need so many parking spaces, car parks, uh, and so on. If half the shopping stays online, you don't need so many shopping malls. So you have to rethink the uses of so much space and obviously shift to walking and cycling, but also potentially massive expansion of micro-mobility too, though that brings its own challenges. I think what's clear is that the car-based city models of the late 20th century will not be with us by the mid uh, of this century. And really just a final point, which uh, has really struck me in, in writing this book and working with different countries around the world. In the arts in a city like Berlin, it's taken for granted art thrives with a lot of help. You have art schools, art academies, you have galleries, you have critics, you have books, you give the artist time to experiment and explore with all sorts of things like the artificial intelligence, um, living painting, I guess, which is shown on the right there from uh, Rafi Nanik. Um, I think the same is true of social imagination. It has to be nurtured, it has to be supported. It needs institutions, and we at the moment largely lack the institutions which do this really well. It needs some money, it needs time, and it needs the use of the methods I've described. But its purpose is really to answer where I started off, to try and fight this fatalism, this pessimism, which has, I think, gripped large parts of our societies in ways which are quite disabling and make it harder for, our, uh, for us to function well. In just the same way as, as individuals, as individual human beings, you know, unless we have some sense in our own lives of what could lie ahead, how our lives could be better, it's quite hard to thrive in the present. So my 
my call, as it were, to city institutions and mayors is get serious about this. Don't be nervous about exploring a hinterland of imaginative possibilities. Many of them won't work. Many of them will turn out to be very different from what actually transpires. You don't have to impose them as blueprints on the whole city. Cities can work in experimental ways, but they're always trying lots of different things and learning from them in real time. But this is the way we help societies become agents in their own future, owners of their own future, rather than pessimistic observers who assume things will probably only get worse. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense and I welcome disagreement, challenge, questions of any kind. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Um, I can just give you an ex uh, impression of what I can see. So ahead of me, there, I'd say there are, I'd say, a hundred plus people, and we have many other people here in these areas that are, I would say, courageous change makers working with public administration, coming here together for City Lab's birthday and Summerfest, and actually making and driving the change within the institutions and an environment that is extremely rigid, as you know. So we have a people protocol. And what you're proposing is something that goes beyond the personal and individual effort. So looking at Berlin and the possibility of an imagination infrastructure or possibilities for imagination infrastructuring. How can people that are ready, prepared to take something on, take it further, actually come to the point where the what if questions that you're posing are not only, let's say, a mental exercise, but are embodying in an environment that is basically restrained by lock-ins and um, past dependencies that are not able, that, that we can't, let's say, break by a de developmental approach, but that needs some disruption. Yeah. So a first thing which I think is very important for our collective imagination is realizing how things have changed for the better in the past. So one little exercise I did in Hamburg two days ago and, and it could ask this audience, you know, what, do. do you know how much of your electricity now comes from renewables? Do most people know Anybody? in Germany what the percentage is? Do you, do you know how much of your electricity, wissen Sie, wisst ihr, wie viel eure, um, eures Stroms aus erneuerbaren Energien kommt? Wer weiß es? I see about three hands. <laughs> so, the correct, in Germany, it's about 41, 42 percent. In the UK, it's a little bit higher, actually. It was 3% 20 years ago when I actually had to work on the government renewable energy plan. And what's amazing to me is it took quite a long time, but it's a fundamental shift, which even very well-informed people are not even aware of. So they think it's impossible to deal with climate change, even though in front of them are these success stories. Another I ask is paper. You've got a piece of... Oh, no, you haven't got paper in front of you. You've got a, I, I have, yeah, I have you one have. piece of so, paper. <laughs> so, yeah, I ask people, what percentage of Europe paper in Europe is recycled now? Do you know the answer? Anybody knows the answer? No hands here. <laughs> it's about... It's 74%. Now, again, it was almost none a generation ago. We have completely transformed some of our systems, but it took 20 years to do that. So it's important we do realise... Change is possible, but we usually overestimate how much can change very short term, but radically underestimate how much can change over 10, 20 or 30 years. So that's a little just a bit of and I think we have to celebrate where those changes happen, all the changes on attitudes to equality or race or transgender, I would put in that category, too. I think what a city like Berlin or London, for that matter, needs is definitely that base of creative individuals who are within bureaucracies and within systems, but on, the, on its own, that's not enough. And I, I think what we need are institutions, you call them imagination infrastructures, I think that's what they are needed, which will usually be have one foot inside and one foot outside the systems. So in a university, it's an institution like the one I showed in Cardiff, which is within the university, but it also is outside the university, it's porous, it's bringing in different pieces. 
Within governments where I've worked, often the most creative innovation teams were half people from the bureaucracy and half from outside. So they could, again, have this dual character of being with, sufficiently within the system, they could achieve change, direct resources, but had sufficient outside perspective. They were creative, flexible, and agile. And so for any bit of city administration, university, philanthropy, all of them need to be supporting these hybrid structures, which then, as you say, can work on the what if problems, not as an intellectual exercise, but also as an exercise which says, what are the first five experiments we will do in the real world to see if our ideas are correct? And, what, and then learning very quickly from doing stuff, not doing it as paper exercises. And I think one of Germany's great strengths is your expert commissions. You're wonderful at bringing together committees of scientists and experts. But I'm a bit skeptical of whether that's the way to achieve change, because this is change where you learn by doing stuff in real time, not by sitting around a table. Okay, I look into the audience and we have five minutes left and I would like to encourage you to actually grab the microphone and let us know in terms of imagination infrastructure for Berlin. What is your wish? Where do you see actually something that is maybe not only like you're also mentioning and all of us are referencing actually experiences of the of the past but in terms of being imagining forward and actually looking at maybe an era where we have to deal differently with our resources differently with our interactions differently in the way we are mobilizing people and also using our privilege of being within a peaceful environment what is something where you'd say okay in terms of forward imagination something that um Berlin maybe also through um, throughout the past months has learned, has actually made possible. Is there some kind of emerging signal, future signals that should be taken forward? Nobody? Come on, Ben. <laughs> City Lab, we need more City Labs. <laughs> I think the interface, the, the state and unfolding into the city. All right, Jeff, we have another three minutes together. So um, I think uh, what we've heard from you is an encouragement to, on the one hand, value the positive change that we have seen, may maybe even make it more visible. And on the other hand, I would argue overthink or also reimagine our approach on how we imagine because what we had in the past was basically surrounded by a wave of endless energy endless material endless possibility and we know latest since february this year the last report of the ipcc is showing us that this optionality space in terms of how we embody our imagination in material or how meta on the one hand and matter on the other hand need a different relationship with each other looking at that and actually looking forward in the next couple of decades what do you suggest in terms of reimagining imagination where is a way forward to maybe leave the path of a kind of developmental idea and enter an age that is more bold more disruptive more um how shall i say radical i don't like the word but any ideas about that yeah and maybe this relates to another thing I, I probably should have said, which is about school kids. And uh, say I spent this morning with school kids in a very two very poor schools in East London. And we focused in for them on fast fashion. At the moment, although 74% of paper is recycled, between one and 2% of clothing is recycled. So we have a hugely non-sustainable relationship with clothing all over the world, and especially for teenagers. And this was a good prompt for them to work on reimagining how would a whole clothing system look differently, 
which change consumption, assumptions, fashion assumptions, reused, shared, remade things, use different kind of materials. And they were so creative, so quickly, with a challenge like that, which linked to their own lives, but also, as you say, to IPCC predictions on what might be uh, unsustainable. I mean, a very different example, which I did mention briefly, which I'm working with some cities on, is this data question. To my mind, we will only achieve a truly net or negative zero city economy if we actually mobilize all the data about emissions, electricity use, transport, and so on, in a collective way to change behavior and patterns. And we become stuck by what were the necessary battles of the last decade on privacy and stopping data harvesting by Google and Facebook, but is now inhibiting us from using knowledge and data and digital for the challenges ahead. And this is such an important space um, and it requires both a change of mindset, but also live experiments in neighborhoods, for example. And it should be easier now, uh, and there's quite a few projects underway on this, because of course people are so incentivized now to cut their energy bills, which at the same time cuts their emissions, that we've got a public who are very open for new ways of using digital and data if it can save them money, but it will also help save the planet. And I would see any serious city needs 10, 20 projects, which are absolutely showing how that can be done using the best of 21st century digital tools to cut people's bills and cut their emissions. And if you haven't got that, there's something wrong. All right, we'll check our strategy. And I think this is a call for smart cities all over the world to actually do that kind of check um, for the future. Thank you so much. This was very inspiring. And um, we look forward to reading the book, but also we look forward to welcoming you uh, at another occasion here in Berlin, sparking um, courage, sparking inspiration and a way forward. Jeff, thanks so much and see you soon. Vielen Dank, auf Wiedersehen. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao.